Good evening. My name is Linda Heine. I'm a member of the New Home League of Women Voters, and I am the moderator this evening uh, at this forum, which is for the candidates for Minnesota Senate District 18 and House District 18A. The forum is being recorded tonight in its entirety without an audience. On September 27, 2022, we're at the Performing Arts Center in the St. Peter High School. The uh, recording will be available uh, for the public. We ask that if the recording is used, that the uh, you understand that editing is authorized only for official media reporting. Excerpts or edited clips of candidate forums may not be used for partisan or political purposes. The League of Women Voters is a local, state, and national nonpartisan volunteer group. We do not support candidates or political parties. The League encourages informed and active participation of citizens in government, and we influence public policy through education and advocacy. Tonight's event is designed to allow candidates the opportunity to express their views on issues that are important to members of the public. We have several questions that we have received tonight, in fact, from members of the public, um, which were forwarded to the League Women Voters before tonight's event. The uh, League, as, as, as I said, the League has received questions. We have question facilitators who screen all of the questions that we receive. We, the uh, facilitators may rephrase, combine, or eliminate questions to avoid duplication. We do not ask questions that are personal in nature or not relevant to the office uh, in, uh, the, for which the forum is presented. But we do not ask questions that are designed simply to make a statement rather than solicit information. And we do not ask questions that are hostile, embarrassing, or inappropriate, or of a personal, personal nature. As the forum moderator, I have the final responsibility to determine which questions will be asked. Our candidates tonight are for two offices. The first is Senate District 18, and the candidates are Mark Wright and Nick Frentz. Our candidates for House District 18A are Susan Ackland and Jeff Brandt. The candidates will each be given two minutes for opening statements. Then on a rotating basis, they will be asked questions. They will, they will have two minutes to answer each of the questions. The, uh, State opening statements, closing statements, and questions will be timed. We have timekeepers uh, present tonight. They will hold up a yellow sign indicating that the candidate has 15 seconds remaining in their two minutes, and then a stop sign after which the candidate must finish the sentence um, that, that has started when the stop sign appears. We've asked the candidates to each be very specific in their opening statements as to the reasons why they are running for office and their unique quality, skills, experience, or expertise they would bring to the job. As I said, the League is all about um, promoting an informed public, and this is your job interview. The League will start opening, Senate, uh, excuse me, opening statements right now first with Senate candidate Nick Frentz. Then we will uh, proceed with Mr. Wright. Then Susan Ackman and Jeff Bryan for the House. With that, if the timekeepers are ready. All right, begin. Well, first of all, welcome everybody. As I've already been introduced, my name is Nick Frentz. I live in North Mankato, and I'm a proud senator for District 19 for the last six years. I want to thank Ms. Heine and the League of Women Voters for having us. This is a great exercise in democracy. A welcome to my fellow candidates and to everybody out there watching. It is no big secret that I'm proud to serve in the Senate and proud to serve our area. Uh, we've lived in Nicollet County since the 1980s, and our four children were all born and raised here, and I'm extremely interested in continuing to serve you and the district and the state senate. Among the reasons I want to serve is to help people. One of the opportunities that you get serving in the legislature is to do things on an individual basis, and it is rewarding both for the people, for the chamber, and then for the legislator. My other life is that I'm a lawyer, I'm a volunteer in the community. I've worked for decades in youth sports, volunteering on charitable boards, nonprofits, and I love it. And in addition to that, I'm proud to be endorsed in this race by various groups, among them the Farm Bureau, Minnesota Farmers Union, Minnesota Police and Fire, Minnesota Chamber of Commerce, Education Minnesota representing the Teachers Union, working men and women, including labor, including faculty at MSU, healthcare, and community living. 
think we have a great place to live and we have a great quality of life. I'm looking forward to the chance to tell all of you about my vision for the Senate and why we should continue on this path. I want to thank you very much and I look forward to the rest of the debate. Thank you for hosting. Thank you for hosting the event tonight. I want to bring my 40 years of business experience. I've been a business owner of a small business and I've been practicing as a business consultant throughout southern Minnesota for the last five years, primarily dealing with either startups or struggling businesses. I believe Minnesota is paying a heavy price right now for its failed leadership. And we have a number of crises brewing throughout the state that need to be addressed. First, I believe our, our safety, public safety personnel were abandoned two years ago. And that decision by our leadership has now manifested itself in a crisis at the local level. It's affecting retaining and attracting public, public safety personnel, both at the sheriff's level and the police departments. We just finished two years of <coughs> remote, lear lear remote learning brought on by an unprecedented and unnecessary masking and shutdown of our schools. Parents got a first-hand chance to see the lack of quality in our educational curriculum. They got to view firsthand the um, political indoctrination brought on by the diversity, equity, and inclusion program, and also uh, discussions about gender with school personnel, not their parents. The results are in. In the last three years, 500 students have left ISD 77. 40,000 students have now been removed from our public education system throughout Minnesota. That's a crisis that needs to be addressed. So Minnesota also needs a financial strategy to stem the exodus of residents and the unattractiveness of our state to outside businesses. So given where we've been in the 30-year hold on this seat, I think change is needed. Talk is cheap. I have 40 years of solving business problems and turning around struggling businesses. 2022 is time for change, and I'm willing, qualified, able to do that. Thank you. Jeff Brandt. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for hosting the League of Women Voters, uh, the, the St. Peter Herald, and then also the St. Peter Chamber of Commerce. My wife and I, Genevieve, settled in St. Peter 15 years ago after we graduated from MSU Mankato. We fell in love with this area and we decided to settle roots. Um, right now we're raising two children, two fine young human beings, Isabel and Leo. And we're our small business owners ourselves in our 11th year. We do native plant landscaping, prairie restorations, ecological services, rain gardens, pretty much you name it. If it's a native plant, we're involved with that process. I grew up on a dairy farm in central Minnesota, and so for me, it's really neat to come full circle back into farming on my own farms. I think it's really important that we continue to do what we can in Minnesota to enrich this landscape, but also to make sure that we protect our resources. Tonight, I'm really looking forward to your questions, and I'm really looking forward to answering these questions. I think this should be a very serious debate, and I really uh, just want to let you know that I'm committed to the issues that I want to talk about tonight as your next state representative. Thank you very much. Thank you. Susan Good evening, and thank you to the League of Women Voters for having us tonight. Um, <clears throat> it, uh, I'm, I'm Susan Atland, and I am just finishing my first term in the House of Representatives. And uh, I came to the uh, decision to run for election in 2019 and ran in 2020. Um, it, was a, it was a decision that I uh, made. There were a couple of big umbrellas that uh, influenced me to run for office, and I'm thinking we'll probably discuss some of those issues later, so I'm not going to define those here. But um, the uh, the first, after I won, I, uh, I say this, in order to learn to swim, you have to get into the water. So I, as a first year legislator, with COVID-19 in place, I uh, felt like I actually jumped off a high cliff into a forging river below, because it was very difficult. We, uh, 
we had uh, only meet, we were only meeting by Zoom. In fact, none of my committees for the last two years have met in person. So I had that challenge first of all. Also, there were also uh, people were not allowed into the state office building, so we did not have a normal conversation. So it was a difficult year. Uh, a difficult two years. It was uh, very challenging for me, having never been in politics. Uh, but I will say this, that uh, we coped, we rose up to the challenge. I was able to uh, work through those difficulties and have come out stronger for it. Uh, I looked back on when I'm, oh, I would just say this, um, when, I looked, when I Googled my name, Susan Ackland, it came up, Susan Ackland, American politician. I'm not a very good politician, but I hope to be a good representative and a good statesman for this district in the next term. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Susan Ackland will be answering this question first, then Jeff Brandt, followed by Nick Fritz, and then Mark Wright. Please tell us what you see as the top budgetary issues and why the legislature must work on them. Thank you for the question. So uh, this year, we had some disappointments. We did not, first of all, pass a bonding bill. That was something that I think all of us would agree needed to have been done, but we could not come to a, to a consensus on that. And it wasn't passed. We didn't pass a tax bill. We need to pass a tax bill. So Minnesotans right now are suffering from inflation. At the doors when I'm talking, that is probably the number one thing, the high cost of food, the high cost of their energy bills, the high cost of transportation. And so budgetarily, we need to address the high cost of inflation. And part of what we need to do is work with the surplus and including making tax cuts, I would say the primary uh, goal that I would hope for early in session is to eliminate the income tax on Social Security. Uh, that would be number one. Budgetarily also, we need to address the waste and fraud that is going on in our state. Recently, even in the news, we hear about the fraud that has happened. So these agencies are appropriated the money. We need to have more accountability from our agencies on how the money is spent and make sure that the money that we spend is actually doing what it was intended to do. Third thing budgetarily is, I think, is the high cost of health care. Health care is another thing that I hear at the doors, and if I bring it up, everybody's nodding their head. Yes, yes, our premiums are too high, our deductibles are too high, our, the cost of meds is too high, and so we need to address this as an overall problem and see how we can help our, especially the uh, small businesses, our farmers who don't qualify for group insurance to make the insurance more affordable for them. Thank you. Jeff I see our number one issue for this district is fully funding our schools. As we are in the St. Peter High School tonight, I just want to point out that I've actually talked to teachers in this particular district who have had to either have a side hustle or sell their plasma in order to keep their lights on at home, while they also teach a full load of students every day in this school. We have a $10 billion surplus in Minnesota House of Representatives. And you know what? Fully funding our schools was part of the agreement that the GOP and the Senate walked away from in this last session. And I think it's really disappointing because there are a lot of teachers, a lot of frustrated parents, a lot of frustrated students for that matter, that are wondering when are they going to get that world-class education that they all deserve. I also think that we ought to fix our sick health care system. Our deductibles are way too high. People are afraid to use their health insurance because it will bankrupt them. And at the end of the day, the healthcare system is actually making all of us more sick. So let's get rid of it and start over. Instead of throwing giant bags of money, taxpayer money at that, and corporations. That's this idea called reinsurance. I was against it when I was your state representative, and I'm against it now. That's a lot of tax money that was thrown at corporations that 
bringing these insurance premiums that are too high. Look at United Health. Look at how much money they made in profits this year alone. Do they need our taxpayer money to subsidize health insurance? Did your insurance go down? And the third thing is, I really think that our government needs to protect our natural resources for future generations. As I talk to people at the doors, what they tell me is this. Government has a job to do. Let's get it done. Thank you. I'll repeat the question. Please tell us what you see as the top budgetary issues and why the legislature must work on them. And uh, Nick Frentz will go first, or third, I should say. <laughs> Thank you. Well, first of all, just for context, the state's two-year budget is about $52 billion, and we're sitting on about a seven to $9 billion surplus. So I think the number one budgetary issue is what about that surplus? I'm in favor of a combination of tax cuts and things that make Minnesota's lives cheaper. Housing, energy, groceries, gas, the cost of living. I think that's what Minnesotans want us to do. A quick point about the state of Minnesota and its finances. We have now had an increase in our rating from Wall Street. We are now a triple A rated state. That means the cost of borrowing for the state of Minnesota is less than ever. That's a good thing and is a tribute not only to the fiscal management of the last couple of decades, but also of our strong pension funding for our state employees. I think a bonding bill is important. We had an agreement at 1.4 billion. This is rare. Both the House and the Senate said 1.4 billion will work and then we could not get it passed. That would be very helpful for the Mankato St. Peter area for the water treatment facility project, which is extremely important and helps keep rates down. Finally, I do think that we can provide tax relief. I would support the repeal of the tax on Social Security. That was part of the deal that was made at the end of the session. And Minnesotans don't always follow these details this closely, but the tax bill at $4 billion was agreed to by both chambers. So we did have a handshake agreement to repeal the Social Security tax on Minnesotans. That would have been a good thing. And in the context of that decision, keep it in mind this way. Of the surplus, about $4 billion was considered structural, that is, ongoing. So we can do stuff with that to make people's lives easier. And I look forward to getting back to St. Paul to be part of those discussions. Thank you. Mark Wright. My business background. My business background says let's not look at the finances and the budget issue as a, as a silo. I think the issue affecting Minnesota right now is we have Minnesotans departing our state because of our high taxes, and we're no longer an attractive site for outside business to relocate. We rank in the bottom 5% of attractiveness from outsiders attempting or thinking about moving here. That's a combination of our personal income tax and our corporate tax rates. So I say we think about, as a Senate and a House, What's a strategy? What's a financial strategy? You have three primary issues, not just the two-year budget. You have a surplus and you have a bonding bill that is sorely needed by local, <coughs> local communities to accomplish their capital improvement needs. So th that's an all-encompassing list of things, but overall, I think we need to look at a strategy. What do we want Minnesota to look like in two, four, or six years? If all we do is talk about the bonding bill, without looking at the surplus, without looking at the budget, and looking two or four years down the road, I think the cap, the human capital we have invested in our Senate and our House is going to go to waste. So let's think about what we want that strategy, and we want, what do we want our state outcome to be when we finish with that process. So I do think there are a lot of good points we're made here. I can tell you among senior citizens that number one issue is stop taxing our Social Security. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> the next question will be presented first with, to Mark Wright, then Nick Frentz, then Susan Ackland and Jeff Grant. The question relates to our schools. What should be the legislature's role, if any, in determining school curriculum and what is taught in schools throughout the state? Um, Mark Wright. Can you just repeat the question again? Sure. There's two parts there. What should be the legislature's role, if any, in determining school curriculum and what is taught in classrooms throughout the state? My understanding or, or appreciation as a center would be that it's our role to see that the education budget is reviewed and approved during the budgetary process. I would guess that there are very, very few experienced teachers 
that serve as senators or legislatures. And I'm not sure that, therefore, that means the greater body is qualified to address the curriculum needs. I believe the curriculum needs to be looked at by the parents and, and also with feedback into the school boards so that the curriculum and the quality of that curriculum meets the needs of the parents. Most of us may not even have children in the, in the school system, so we may not necessarily be the best qualified people. And I'm certainly our experience, unless we're a, an educator with a master's or a PhD to our name, we're not qualified to be talking about the curriculum. Let's leave that up to the individuals in the Department of Education, and more importantly, at the local school board level and the parent level. Hey, friends. Well, thank you. I think one of the things that Minnesota's done a great job of over the years is education. As the parent of four children born and raised in the area of public schools, I'm extremely proud of them. And a point of personal privilege, Ms. Heine, is that of the 19 states that require the ACT in this country, Minnesota ranks number one in highest ACT scores. And when we talk to families and parents about the curriculum, what they want to know is how good are the schools, how good is the curriculum, and here's what I think the legislature's role is. Our number one role is to fund. It's our job to provide a quality education to these students, and funding is the first and foremost responsibility of the legislature. Two, on the curriculum. We've had this discussion. I'm glad to hear what the St. Peter area and the Cato area schools have been doing. They have open portals for parents to have input. I think that's a good thing. They have robust parent-teacher conferences and input on curriculum. And probably the biggest thing they have, and you may have noticed some signs around the district, is school board elections, where candidates have to put their thoughts about education and the curriculum on the ballot. I think that's a healthy democracy, and even after those candidates are elected to the school board, and I'm the son of a school board member, the people can come to the school board meetings and offer their thoughts on curriculum. One of the great tensions for us as educators is how much do we talk about our past and the things we aren't proud of? I think the answer is some. We have to provide our kids an education to understand where we've been if we're going to have to ask them to be good at where they're going. Finally, I think the legislature has to be a supporter of education. It's something that's driven Minnesota's success in the past and it's going to drive it in the future. And I'm very proud of the things that the area schools have done and just as proud of the students and teachers. Thank you. I will repeat the question. What should be the legislature's role, if any, in determining school curriculum and what is taught in classrooms throughout the state? And Susan Ackland is next. Thank you for the question. Very good. Um, so I agree. Most of uh, the other two have mentioned that the state's number one role is to fully fund our schools. Um, critically important. Uh, in the first session of this biennium, we did fully fund the schools and actually it had a percentage increase over the base from the year before. Uh, so that's, that's primary for the legislature to do that every year. Um, regarding curriculum, it is um, widely accepted, I think by most people, that the curriculum really should be decided not by the state, not by the Board of Education, by, but by local school boards with parental input. So that is where the, the final decision should come, and this is where the parents have the greatest influence to know what curriculum is in the school and how, that can be, how they can affect uh, the appropriateness of it uh, on all levels, on all levels. Our goal here is to educate our children. We need to, uh, the COVID pandemic has uh, sort of put on the spotlight some of the learning uh, deficiencies that our children have right now. And I think we can overcome that, but we need to focus on literacy. We need to focus on reading and writing and bring our children back up to the level that they need to be. I think I've heard that 40% uh, of the kids are, before, uh, are below the reading level for their grade. So let's focus on literacy, let's focus on math. And uh, then the third part point I would like to make, and this could be enacted by the legislature, is to give parents school choice. And we can do that in a variety of ways, and that might include educational savings accounts, or just, uh, there's other options, but school choice would be big on my priority list to allow parents to put their kids in the school that is right for them. Jeff Brandt. 
I think it's really important that we talk about the word partnership when we're talking about working with school boards and parents and everybody that we represent in the district that we serve when we talk about curriculum. It's also working with the Department of Education to decide what things are missing from our students' education, what things can we enrich our students' lives with. Basically, they have to be at school Monday through Friday for a certain amount of hours every day. Let's make sure that their time is used correctly and they're, they're having a valuable experience. Kind of goes back to what I was talking about initially. We have to make sure that our teachers are making a little wage so they're not stressed out and burnt out um, and they feel like they can't even do the job. For our students, making sure that we have mental health uh, professionals in each of our schools, make sure we have the resources available for those students that are in trouble, that are in need, that are having an achievement gap issue. We need to make sure that we address that as well with resources. You know, at the legislature, there's a lot of ideas. There's 201 legislators that can write whatever bill they want, and there's some real doozies. If you look it up on, online at the House website or the Senate website, um, there's some real ideological things that are going on in education right now. But I gotta, I gotta also make sure that I point out the record here, because it's about accountability. Um, when my opponent says that um, that they funded, or when she said we funded education, um, I have to point out that she actually voted against every education bill that passed through the chamber in the last biennium. And so they didn't in the House GOP. It was the DFL that led, and it was working in partnership with the GOP and the Senate and getting it passed into law. That's how it got done. But there were a lot of bad ideas, let's face it, there are a lot of bad ideas that were proposed in the legislature. And I think it's time we get the ideology out of the classroom and we get back to the basics. And I think that's really important for all of us to hear tonight. Our next, collection, our next question relates to elections. As a member of the legisla legislature, what measures, if any, would you support to reinforce or ensure voter confidence in our elections? And we will have Jeff Brand first, then Susan Ackland, then Mark Wright, and finally Nick Frentz for that question. Election day is upon us. Friday, as of Friday, people can go in and vote. In the particular district that I'm looking to serve, uh, there is a portion of the, of the district that's um, mail-in ballot only. Now they can take their ballot in and, and vote in person at the county courthouse or they can decide to, to fill it out at home and send it in and be counted. In Minnesota, we have a no excuse early absentee voter um, process. So people can wander in whenever they want and vote. And you know what? This last election was fair and free. And I think it's really important to point that out because we haven't be counted in our district. And I think I actually gained three votes in the, in the recount but there is no fraud. And I think that's really important to understand when we're talking about um, election security. Now on Friday I attended a, uh, a rally of sorts and it was for early voting. I think it's really exciting to get people excited and interested to talk about voting. My opponent attended a rally, a storm in the Capitol rally, where people were threatening our governor, his family, Democrats, judges, everybody uh, was threatened that day, right before she took the microphone. And to this day, there are actually people I've talked to at the door who have asked, Representative, who won that last election? And to this day, there is no definitive answer that's been given. So, in short, as your next state representative, I will defend democracy in the state. I support democracy through voting, voting early, voting on election day, and I will continue to do so when elected in 2022. Thank you. Thank you. Susan Atkins. Thank you again for the question, and thank you for your comments, um, Mr. Brand. Um, two things, well, more than two things. Uh, as he listed the importance of being able to vote, and everybody having a say, he left out an important. He left out one important thing, and that he didn't say that everybody must be a legal voter and everybody must be registered to vote. 
So in order to just close that little gap, or that little loophole in, in possibility, what we recommend is that we have voter ID. That everybody, even, no matter where you go, if you want to buy cigarettes or, or alcohol or get on a plane or cross the border, you have to have an ID. So it's not, un, it's not unreasonable to expect people to have an ID when they go to vote, just to show who you are. But if you get to the polls and you don't have a, a voter ID, you can register right there. You can register right then and there. You can cast your ballot. And then we would put it in a, what's called a provisional ballot. And then that provisional ballot is verified that that person is who they say they are. And if that passes muster, then that vote is counted. So that is, if we want to have election integrity, if we want to have a secure democracy, we need to know for sure that every vote that is counted is a legal uh, registered voter. So to answer this question about January the 6th, because of storm the Capitol, it was actually called, called Stop the Steal. Because whether you are a person who thinks the election was stolen or not doesn't matter. Because there are people on both sides who feel so passionately about that. He characterized the rally as a radical rally. What I saw, and I was there, was people on their knees praying in the snow for our state. People who were praying for our country. Thank you. Thank you. I will reread the question before we turn to our Senate candidates. As a member of the legislature, what measures, if any, would you support to reinforce or ensure voter confidence in our elections? And Mark Wright will answer first. So first order of business, I'm going to take care of is I'm going to defend Susan Ackland. I don't believe there's a bone in her body that would call for an overthrow or a radical. So first order of business I'm going to take care of is I don't believe there's a single bone in Susan Ackland's body that would call for an overthrow or any kind of radical movement. I've worked with her for over two and a half years. So Jeff Brand is completely out of left field. He does not know Susan Brand the way I do. And I, don't, and I believe that what she has just iterated as the, what happened that day is the truth. So voter integrity. <clears throat> I come from the business world. Many of you may remember from the 1990s, an incident that took place in Philadelphia where a few bottles of Tylenol were found to be defective. In fact, they contained an arsenic-like product that was making people sick. It only took a few bottles. Johnson & Johnson spent millions of dollars and lots of time and engineering effort to figure out how they developed a foolproof bottle that couldn't be, couldn't be tainted by the public. And today they produce tens of millions of bottles of that product that go safely out into, into the consumer's hands. So let's think about our voting process. If we have just one vote in this state or any state that is cast illegally, we have a flawed process. You've now questioned the quality of the vote. So, I believe we need to have voter ID here in, in Minnesota, and it can be easily done. And we have a lot of driver licenses out there. Um, the other issue I hear from, from people here in rural Nicola County is they would like to see in-person voting on the day of election. We have a number of mail-in ballot-only precincts, and I believe we can find a way with a surplus money to develop that a process where we can open up uh, in-person balloting in some of those precincts. Thank you. Nick Friends. Well, I know if I served in the Senate long enough, we'd get into a debate where we had some teeth to it, and I do respect and appreciate the league having us here, but I'm going to uh, humbly disagree. First of all, we should not be making it harder for registered voters to vote. We should not do things that make it so voters who are legally voting find it tougher. I'm going to spare us the things that are going on in other states, like uh, going from 50 drop boxes to one in the city of Houston. But I would ask the listeners here, what are the reasons people want to change those rules, and which group of voters is most likely to be affected by those rules? And I would implore League of Women Voters members to ask yourself, are we fighting for democracy here or not? Now to the election. Come from a youth sports background. I think kids need to study in class and they need something to do afterwards. We tell our kids after the game, win or lose, be a good sport. That's important in democracy too. And for those that claim the 2020 election was stolen, I really feel bad for you. 
There is no evidence. There were 60 lawsuits that the former president brought, every one of them defeated. And in the great state of Minnesota, which, by the way, has the number one voter turnout in the country, we are extremely proud of our voter integrity. So ask yourself this with the voter ID proposal. How many people attempting to commit fraud will that prevent? I believe we had 18 reports of fraud attempted in the last election of which six votes did not count. And then ask yourself how many eligible voters will find it more difficult because of the provisional ballot, because of the difficulty of voting, because of the questions, and that number will be many, many times. In other words, you have undermined the very point of our democracy, which is one person, one vote. I will say that the mail-in voting is an interesting feature to make it easier for some voters to vote. I do like how it works, and I do think it has a place in Minnesota. What I'm most proud of is the number one voter participation in the country, and the league gets to take a little credit for that. Thank you. All right, the next question will be presented first to our Senate candidates, Nick Friends first, and Mark Wright. The House candidates will be, uh, well, the order will be Susan Ackland and then Jeff Brandt. And the question is, because we don't have enough heat going, <laughs> many are concerned with increased gun violence in our communities. What legislation, if any, would you support to help reverse this current trend and respond to the need for safer communities? And as I said, Nick Friends goes first. I support background checks and red flag laws. And the reason I support them is that they reduce gun violence in the states where they've tried it. I consider myself a responsible gun owner. Uh, my family took me hunting out of Comparts Landing in Swan Lake when I was a youngster. I think that's a part of Minnesota's heritage, and I think if you talk to the people who enjoy hunting, they would tell you we can be safe with our guns. Where we are now with guns is exactly where people predicted we would be 30 years ago. More guns has made us less safe. More guns has led to, I know this is surprising, more people being shot. And as we watch school children do school shooting drills, think about that. Ask yourself, how is that good for the learning environment? How's that, how's that gonna help our children have a positive experience? Those two basic changes, red flag laws and universal background checks are supported by law enforcement. And as we watch the issues of crime come forward, I'd just like to remind the group, I'm proud to be endorsed by the Minnesota Police and Peace Officers Association that is a tough endorsement to get. And what they want is safer streets just like the rest of us. And what they want less guns in the hands of people and less people getting shot. And with those two changes, as they have seen in other states, Minnesota can do that. And I will add, as we knock through the district, I hear a lot about that from voters saying, can you please make these streets safer? Thank you. Mark Ray. The question of increased gun violence brings the question, where's the data? Who's causing the gun violence, and what are the reasons behind the individual that's caused the gun violence? I think we would find that mental health is behind a lot of the gun violence that goes on here. It's not guns randomly going off. There's a person behind that gun when violence occurs. So, I'm in favor of making sure that we perform background checks in here. We have a permit process here in place in Minnesota. If there are loopholes in it, either in certain organizations are exempt from it, for whatever reason, we need to address those loopholes and see that they have to follow the same process as somebody like Mr. Friends and myself who go into Shields to buy a gun. You need to have a permit and you're going to be subject to a background check. And if you want a concealed carry permit, you're going to go through the same process. So, red flag laws, I'm not an attorney, but from what I've read on it, it raises more legal issues than it problems it probably solves. And that would require an incredible amount of robust debate, both in the Senate and the House, with lawyers present telling us what all the tricks and traps are of red, red flag laws. So, before we get engage me in a conversation in gun laws, let's just make sure all the guns are taken out of the hands of the bad guys first. Thank you. Again, many are concerned with increased gun violence. What legislation, if any, would you support to help reverse this current trend and respond to the need for safer communities? And Susan Ackman would be next. Thank you. So, um, Nick asked the question, 
What has made us less safe? When I look back over the years and how this gun violence has increased, how violence of all sorts has increased, and I, I want to look at this whole problem uh, instead of looking at it in silos. So uh, Mark mentioned mental health, mentioned guns and gun control. There's also other pieces to this. There's a civil rights piece, and there's a public safety piece. And so what I think we should do, and what I would recommend, is that instead of looking at this in silos, having this person talk, you know, let's make a rule for this, let's make a rule for that, let's pull ourselves together and look at the picture as a whole. Because when I look at what, who has been uh, committing some of these atrocities, I mean, your heart, your heart just wrenches when you think about Sandy Hook. Your heart just wrenches when you think about Rivaldi or Columbine. There, there has to be an answer. But it is not just one thing. It is just not, this is going to solve the problem. It won't solve it. So we need to look at all these pieces. We need to look at public safety. We need to look at uh, mental health, particularly mental health, because a lot of these things are committed by just angry young people. And what has caused this problem in our society? I think that's a problem, uh, an issue I can't really address right this moment. I, I have some ideas on it. But we have a society that has lost its respect. We have lost respect for law enforcement. We've lost respect for parents. We've lost respect for school authorities. And when you lose respect, that means you can also lose respect for a human life. And so uh, I would just recommend that we look at this as a big picture and really go together to the legislature next year or in January and start this process to come up with an answer, implement the answer, and then make sure that we're actually making a difference in gun violence. Jeff Brandt. So when we're talking about being state representatives, it's important to point out partnerships. It's important to talk about what would you do to partner with county attorneys? I just talked with Patrick McDermott over at Florida County when we were at the Florida County Fair together. And he was saying that the, uh, the number of felons with guns in Florida County has increased. It's actually spiked. How are felons that aren't supposed to have guns getting guns? Okay? That's an actual issue. That's something that actually the legislature should address. I think about uh, the county, actually, the county sheriff signs off on people's uh, concealed and carry permits. They're actual people that are turned down every year in this county and every other county across the state because of serious issues. Whether it be um, issues dealing with mental health or because they assaulted other uh, spouses or girlfriends or that sort of thing. Um, and those are issues too that we have to address. There are actual people that go to gun shows and straw buy these guns and then sell them on the streets. That needs to be addressed. I am absolutely in favor of universal background checks as a responsible gun owner myself. I'll go through that same process every time to make sure that I'm doing what's right. And I believe everybody else should do the same. And yes, I do believe that extreme risk, uh, extreme risk protection orders, also known as red flag laws, would probably have saved Svetlana Munt's life. She was gunned down in front of her children in Rasmussen Woods not too long ago. So we're going to have to talk about Uvalde or the other horrendous acts that have taken place across the country. They've happened here. Finally, what I want to say is that I am um, a Protect Minnesota and Moms Demanding Action endorsed candidate. And I think that means a lot. Because I had to go through the rigors of the endorsement process. And my voting record stands for itself. I am absolutely in favor of both universal background checks and red flag laws. And we'll do so again in 2023. Thank you. All right. The next question will be presented first to the House candidates, Jeff Brand, then Susan Ackland, then uh, Nick Prince and Mark Wright. This question relates to electric vehicles in the state of Minnesota. As electric vehicles become more reliable and available to the public, how can the state encourage Minnesota residents, businesses, and governmental agencies to transition to electrical vehicles? Jeff Frank. Back in the day when they were horse and buggy and the first cars showed up, 
they were expensive. And it seemed like everybody kind of was really intrigued and wanted to know more about it. They were maybe the safest things because we had known how to ride a horse or, or use a horse and buggy for many, many centuries. But like what we have today, everybody almost owns an, 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 an automobile. Now we're looking at transitioning, not just for the economic purposes, but also for our environmental purposes, into EV vehicles. And wouldn't it be nice if you were a consumer, you could go to a car dealership and have more than one option? If you look at the market, the market is actually driving this change. There are fleets of vehicles who are changing from regular vehicles to, to electric vehicles. At some point, there's going to be more electric vehicles on the road than there are gasoline engines. It may not be tomorrow. It may not be in the next decade but it's coming. We have to build out that infrastructure so that people with EVs have the opportunity to charge wherever they at. We have to build out our infrastructure so the base load is there for all of these vehicles that are driving around. And the more vehicles that become on the market, the more vehicles that are bought, and the more vehicles who are traded in, offer more opportunities for people who are lower income to take advantage of buying a used vehicle. There will be more used vehicles on the market eventually. And I really think that in uh, 2020, uh, 2035, rather, with GM and some other organizations that are building these vehicles that are switching to fully EV, that's the way it's going to be going forward. Now, as a state, we can promote it, or we can get in the way. And I think that we ought to do a better job of investing and making sure that we're not getting in the way in the state of Minnesota. Because everybody else, eventually, is going to have an electric vehicle. Susan Abbott. When you look at this issue, I think that the one thing that is... Um, what he talked about uh, back in the days when the first cars were here, the government did not mandate everybody needs to turn your horse in and buy a car. And that's what we're seeing happening today with our governor and his uh, California cars policy. They want everybody to buy a certain type of car. That is not, that is not the way to let this flow. If some of the things uh, Mr. Graham said were true, that somebody would all be driving electric vehicles, maybe so. But that, the market should drive that. It should not be a mandate on the car dealers that they have to carry X number of electric vehicles. The car dealers have told me, no, they don't want that. They are opposed to it. And you might hear something different, but that came from a car dealer in Mankato to me personally. The other thing is, these electric vehicles, we, we may not be ready for them yet because of this issue of uh, the batteries. We get our raw materials from, uh, from China and from other, other countries, like somewhere in Africa, I don't know, I can't say. But the raw materials are not even being allowed to be mined in Minnesota, and so we are going to be dependent on other countries for these batteries. And then nobody's talking about what are we going to do with these batteries when they've gone dead. And what are we, how are we going to charge all these batteries when we don't have the infrastructure in place to uh, charge them up? And so I, I just say, you know what? We want clean energy. We, and maybe part of this is through electric vehicles. That's okay, that's fine. But it needs to let the market dictate. It need, they need to be reliable, they need to be affordable, it needs to be consistent. And so let the market determine when and if we all are driving electric vehicles in the future. Do you want me to repeat the question? Yeah. Okay. As electric vehicles become more reliable and available to the public, how can the state encourage Minnesota residents, businesses, and governmental agencies to transition to electric vehicles? Nick Prince. Well, thank you. First of all, this question begs the obvious issue of climate change. We're now to the point in this country when we have 84 climate change related storms a year that cause more than $1 billion worth of damage. So in order to say how fast we need to get to electric vehicles or other forms of clean energy, we've got to figure out what the cost is if we don't. 
I mean this with all due respect, I've been in the Senate for six years and I have still not heard a Republican plan to address climate change in a way that doesn't say market forces. In the 1950s, companies dumped toxic chemicals into Lake Erie, in the Cleveland area. Why? Because it was legal and because that would produce a greater profit. That's market forces for that portion of the population. We can't have that. We're burning up the planet now and we have to take action. What the state can do is multiple things. One, bond for the EV infrastructure. Charging stations, those things that make it easier. The long-term 10-year outlook for the cost of an electric vehicle is already less. How do you know? Because Ford and General Motors have already told you they're not going to make anything else by 2035. They're corporations that are formed for profit, and they are factoring in the need to address climate change and how it will affect car sales in this country. Now, what can we also do is take advantage of the recently passed Inflation Reduction Act, which has over $368 billion of dollars available around the country for clean energy and climate change. And the state of Minnesota's got some opportunities. Again, not just in electric vehicles, but in hydrogen, in storage, and in the kind of innovation that America's been great at. We have to have some faith that Americans, when given incentive, will innovate. We also can have tax credits at the state level. As many of you know, that's a feature of the federal law. We can pull together, and if we follow that path, we would be at about 10 to 12% new car sales of electric vehicles by about 2035, so that we're still going to be buying and selling internal combustion vehicles. And I bet Americans will have greater innovation by then in addition to the things we've done now. Thank you. Mark Wright. So we're a country that's been founded on freedom, right to choose various products and what have you. I am not in favor of forcing a vehicle choice on the American public or the Minnesota public. So if we were to move the incentives behind electric cars right now, let's let the market determine which brands are going to be successful and what kind of product and what kind of performance data are they going to have to have. Susie brought some, makes some excellent points relative to batteries. The battery technology is not there today. Electric car range is about 200 miles. Gas driven cars probably four to 500 miles. Here in Minnesota, we also have severe winters. What happens to the, to the range of electric vehicle when you need to drive from Mankato to the Twin Cities and the temperature outside is zero and the wind's blowing about 20 miles an hour? I don't think you're gonna have a very good experience with your electric vehicle. So the other issue right now is an electric vehicle, on average, costs twenty-one thousand dollars more than a fossil-driven car, fossil fuel-driven car. That's a big problem. And right now, inflation is a problem with most of our citizens here in Minnesota, and they're very concerned about it. So I believe that the market will work in favor of eventually producing a car that's economical and can be driven long distances. The cell phone market is a prime example where the private market developed a product based upon consumer demand and need for features, data retention, longevity performance, without a subsidy from the state or federal government. So that's where I'm in favor of letting the private market work this out and let the consumer demand determine how fast that product comes onto the marketplace. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, this next question will be presented first to Mark Ray, then Nick Prince, then Jeff Fram, and Susan Eklund. Farmland covers much of District 18. What do you see as top agricultural issues and how might you address them? If you talk to a farmer and you ask him this question, there's one answer that comes up all the time. We want less regulation. They're constantly frustrated by new regulations that come on. They have regulations that require them to lose cropland without any compensation from the state or the county relative to taxes. So the number one issue among farmers is they want less regulation. The other issue that's come, that comes about <clears throat> when you talk to farmers is, is a financial one. We currently have an estate tax in here that that goes into effect at $3 million in, in a state tr asset transfer. They want that done away with so they can pass farms on to their to the next generation. So I think that kind of answers the question on, on farming and the amount of people that we serve here in Eklund County. 
and Krentz. Thank you for the question. We have 17 rural townships and seven District 19, and I'm proud to represent them. Also proud to be endorsed in this race by Minnesota Farm Bureau. That's the voice of agriculture in this state, and their endorsement means they're asking voters to vote for me for the best chance for Minnesota Farm Bureau members to have what they need. Also endorsed by Minnesota Farmers Union. Why does that matter? Because here's what farmers want. They want to have success on the farm, and they want to pass it to the next generation. Those are things we have been doing, we can do, and we will do in the future. Here are some areas where I think it's important. First of all, I serve on the Senate Agriculture Committee. I'm proud of that too. I'm a member of the Nicola County Pork Producers and work very hard to promote agriculture. We have about a $21 billion agriculture industry in this state, and we've done a lot of things that we should keep doing. One example, uh, the Crookston Soybean Crush Plant. We put about $4 million into that, and it's going to help us not only process soybeans in the Crookston area, which will decrease transportation costs, but make these farms more profitable. Secondly, we want to have a farm to school tax credit review. We want to make it so that farmers don't pay an unfair share. Now, the state can pick that up, especially in a time of surplus, and I'm supportive of taking that from 70% to 85%, and so are our farmers. Finally, as we transfer to the next generation, we already have beginning farmer credits. That's a credit that can go into the next generation that wants to get them into farming. As we look at our rural communities, which is just as important a part of Minnesota as anywhere else, we have to do things that make families want to take the next generation and stay there. And in addition to that, farmers tell us we have to have rural broadband. And on that score, cavalry is coming. We have hundreds of millions of dollars in federal grants for rural broadband. The state has put $60 million in, and I'm very proud that that, too, is under the jurisdiction of the Senate Agriculture Committee. Thank you. Farmland covers much of District 80, excuse me, District 18. What do you see as the top agricultural issues, and how might you address them? And uh, Jeff Brand will answer first for the House candidates. You know, that's a very good question. When I talk to farmers, there are a lot of varying different, yeah, there are a lot of different answers. It depends on who you really talk to. Um, some are really concerned with the amount of water that's flowing through their land. How do they get that water off of the surface so they can continue to grow their crops? Or this year, how do I get more water? Because it's pretty dry out there right now. There are a lot of issues in the agriculture country that we have to tackle. Climate change is obviously making our lands hotter and drier. That can mean a bonus for particular crops, but it can also hinder uh, the ability for farmers to make uh, an incentive to, uh, to be a farmer anymore. Obviously, it's about passing that farm on to the next generation. I remember my family had a conversation about what they were going to do with their dairy, uh, whether they were going to pass it to the next generation or not. That was a hard conversation, and I know there are a lot of folks that are having the same conversations. You know, when I was the state representative, I was the vice chair of the Agriculture Committee, and we talked a lot about farm safety. And we did something about it because unfortunately we were losing uh, people to grain bin accidents and other accidents with tractor rollovers. The state legislature has to be responsive when there's a need for certain incentives to, to make the, the job itself more safe. And it's something that we addressed when there was too much snow and farmers had their roofs collapse. The Minnesota House of Representatives addressed the issue. We passed the bill to get some money for the RFA account in order for farmers to get their um, their uh, sheds back up. And we also addressed the issue when we were finding farmers are having mental health issues. We spent more money and got more people resourced to, to carry out the, the duties in the field to get farmers the, the help that they needed. At the end of the day, uh, we had about $145 million worth of requests and we were able to only spend $7 million. But in a $50 billion budget, $7 million is not a lot of money. And I really do think that we can do more at the legislature to invest in agriculture in Minnesota. Thank you. Susan Adlett. Thank you. So uh, one thing I've been impressed by in the legislature is that anytime we talk about agriculture and our farmers, most frequently we come to an agreement. The uh, agriculture bill was passed uh, with bipartisan support. So uh, we are all I think on this uh, panel here in favor of supporting our farmers in this community, especially across the state. But you know, we pay particular attention to the farmers in our own community. Um, 
one thing I've heard recently by a farmer, he's, he said to me, when you get back next year, we need to change the date that the, these insecticides can be applied uh, in the spring, I believe. But he, he mentioned a date, and it's like, okay, when the time comes, let's work on that and try to uh, work that through the, both the Ag Committee sometimes and, or the Environment. Now, I wasn't on Ag, but I was on the Environment, and the things that we work on in the Environment Committee so frequently apply right directly to our farmers. So I'm always, I'm always trying to balance what's right for our farmers and our ag community with what's right for our uh, environment also. And I think we've done a pretty good job of that. Um, the other thing that uh, I didn't get to mention uh, when we were talking about the electric vehicles that I should have is that one thing that requiring these electric vehicles, Minnesota is not uh, California. And our economy has a huge rural uh, uh, effect on our on, on the state's economy and so if we are not producing if our farmers are not uh, putting their corn crops into biofuels and biodiesels they are going to be severely impacted some of our farmers uh, put as many as 50 percent of their crop into uh, biofuels uh, some are as many as much as 80 percent and so we need to take that into account when we're considering going all electric, how it is going to affect the farmers in this district. Thank you. Uh, I think we have enough time left for me to ask you two more questions. The first one will be just a, a, a question and we'll each have two minutes to respond. And then I'm going to end with what we call the lightning round here at the League of Women Voters. And you'll just have a yes or no, yes or no option. So the first question, again, this will be a two minute response time. Uh, presented first to the House candidates and relates to women's health. Uh, given the, su the U.S. Supreme Court's decision relating to the Roe versus Wade case, state legislatures may be enacting new laws regarding women's reproductive health issues, including access to care. What measures, if any, do you think the Minnesota legislature should enact regarding women's reproductive health and abortion? Uh, let's see, first we have uh, Susan Ackman for that question, then Jeff Brand, then Mark Wright, and finally Nick Brents. So I was just waiting for this question to come up. Uh, it is a, a topic that um, that is frequently discussed, but it's not really the main topic that I'm that people are concerned about when I'm talking to them at the door. But um, I would just start out by saying everyone is aware that I am a pro-life candidate. Um, I was on the street the other day, on Saturday, it was a beautiful day, and I happened to pass by a man and a woman coming towards me, and I stopped to engage them in, uh, I'm Susan Ackland, I'm running you know, for office. We had a nice conversation. Something kind of caught my attention, what the man said about abortion, but we didn't really go there. Uh, but when we were finished talking about the other issues, inflation and uh, public safety, et cetera, I came back to him and I said, you know what, you said something that caught my attention. Would you like to, to you know, talk about this abortion issue? So I actually invited him to talk about it. So as the man and the woman were talking, I could tell she was very pro-choice, and that was fine, we were having a polite conversation, and I turned to the man, and I looked at him, and he said to me, I he said, at conception, sort of affirming what his wife was saying, but at the same time he said, at conception, there's a spark of life and there is a soul. And that struck me. That's, that's the crux of our, our, all of our debates. Um, there is a soul. And so as we move forward, I don't think there's going to be any changes in the law next, in the next session or, or for, for some time to come. Because that would have to be made by by overturning a Supreme Court ruling or going to the uh, to the vote of the people. But uh, I just would say this: that um, I think we need to have polite conversations about this and work together on finding a solution and, and stopping the divisiveness that this is causing in our society. Jeff Brand. Well, this is a serious issue, and I think it demands a serious answer. In the last uh, session, my opponent actually signed on to a bill that criminalized abortions. 
Then later that week, she actually took, struck her name from the bill. And while my opponents deciding how extreme she would wish to be in the legislature as your representative, let me be clear. I am a pro-life, I'm sorry, a pro-choice candidate, and at the end of the day, I believe that the only reason that we should be having this discussion is to allow a woman and her doctor to have that conversation alone. Again, to reiterate, pro-choice candidate, and at the end of the day, I'm, I'm uh, endorsed by Planned Parenthood and also by uh, Pro-Choice Minnesota. And I think it's really important for every woman listening, doesn't matter what party you belong to. At the end of the day, do you want your government to mandate your reproductive health? Or do you want to have that choice and the freedom to do it yourself? One of the people that are here on stage today was just advocating for that same thing when it came to electric vehicles. But I'm talking about your health as an individual in the state of Minnesota. Thank you. Uh, again, the question is, what measures, if any, do you think the Minnesota legislature should enact regarding women's reproductive health and abortion? And Mark Wright is next. I have a very short, sweet answer to that question. I don't think we should be enacting it. There are laws on the books right now, and the debate that would occur in both the House and the Senate would cripple any other discussion we could have on the issues that we really need to be addressing when the, when the House and the Senate convene in January. We have major financial issues to resolve. We have a two-year budget that needs to be agreed to. We have a bonding bill that did not get done this last time, and the inflationary impact on that is going to be huge. We need to come up with solutions so we can make that happen. And we have a surplus to deal with. So I don't believe there's room in the agenda in the, in the, in the near future for a discussion on this. And the election today, most people are not necessarily bringing up Roe versus Wade. They certainly aren't bringing it up to me when I'm out meeting with them. And I've met hundreds of people in District 18. I've had one or two people ask me about it, and I state very clearly, I'm pro-life. I don't think we need to have a discussion on this. It will sidetrack addressing the other issues that are currently in crisis mode here, and not only District 18, but in the state. We have rampant inflation, we have rising crime, and a concern by citizens over public safety, and we have a concern over the quality of our education. Those are the issues we really should be focused on. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, friends. Well, thank you, and I want to say, Mr. Wright, it's been good to you tonight, uh, but I think the voters of this district are going to be very surprised to hear that we should not be discussing women's reproductive rights. I believe what we're hearing from the people in this district is that that is on their minds, and it's very important. What I saw this summer was that we had a Supreme Court decision that was supported by three justices who, during their confirmation hearing, said that they would let the existing law stand and almost immediately turned around and overturned 50 years of precedent. We've spent 100 years in this country working towards gender equality, the right to vote, the right to work, all the rights that humans expect. Women's rights are human rights. And with the stroke of a pen, those rights are gone. And what I'm hearing at the doors is women saying they are very upset. What I stand for is that women have the right to make that decision. Representative Acton, I appreciate your perspective on the spark. And I've talked to just as many people as everyone up here about how they look at it. I respect and understand where people are coming from. What I don't understand is why the government would step in and say, I'm going to give my view of it to you when you make that decision with your doctor. And what the state of Minnesota can do is review the bills that are already out there. There's an option to codify Roe v. Wade. I look forward to that debate. This is a pressing issue, and by many surveys, it is the number one reason that Minnesotans have said that they will vote when they weren't sure they were going to vote before. Let me say that again. The number one reason Minnesota voters say that they are going to vote is this issue, and voters in this district deserve to hear what candidates have to say about it and where they stand on it, and I am a pro-choice candidate. Thank you. Okay. As I said, this is a lightning round question. Um, you will each just be asked to respond with a yes or no to the following question. The in the order will be right down the line. Nope, not quite. Yes, it will. Nick Frantz, Mark Wright, Susan Ackland, and Jeff Grant. You sat a little out of order. 
the, the question is, would you support prohibiting the sale of flavored tobacco products, yes or no? Yes. 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 Absolutely yes. <laughs> and now are we ready for closing, closing remarks? Uh, we will begin, the order for closing remarks will be Jeff Brand, then Susan Ackland, Nick Frentz, and Mark Wright. Uh, Jeff Brand. There are a lot of things that uh, were discussed tonight. Those are some really important issues, and they require serious answers. At the end of the day, um, some of the things that were talked about I wanted to quickly mention. When I was your state representative, I passed 13 bipartisan bills into law. Some of those bills actually had more Republican authors than they did uh, DFL authors in the House. And the majority of them had GOP Senate authors. That's how you get things done, folks. You roll up your sleeves and you get to work. The politics stops the water's edge and you start working together to get things done. In fact, working better together is actually been the mantra of this campaign since they ran it in 2018 and it hasn't changed. The voters of this district are the boss. And they have to decide who they're going to hire to be their next representative. Are they going to hire somebody that has a strong work ethic, that punches in every day and shows up to the job, and gets stuff done for the people of this district? Things like Highway 14 from the Nick to Dumont, or farm safety, or ensuring that our, our taxes are fair by reducing the, the, working, uh, the working family tax credit or increasing the, the working family tax credit and lowering taxes for working families? Yes, I got that done. I partnered with the, Nick, with the city of St. Peter and we got some much needed resources brought over to the regional treatment center in order to make that job more safe. I partnered with the city of North Mankato to fund $2 million worth of investments into the Caswell Park to make that place where it should be, a destination. I've done all that stuff and I guarantee you I will do that all again. You're the voter, take a look at our records. We all have records now with the legislature. I don't have an absence. I never once decided not to vote on a bill. I showed up, I punched in, and I'm looking for your vote here on November 8th. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Susan Ackland. Again, I think we need to understand the differences in um, his first term and my first term. His first term, he was in the majority. As When you're in the majority, you get a lot more done. I'll give an example. In the um, Health and Human Service Bill, the omnibus bill that we voted on at the end of the session, Within that bill, there were 254 bills, and I might be off by a few, but 254, 284, something like that. Of those 254 bills, only two of them had a Republican author. So what I found in committee, they would not hear my bills. The only way I could get a hearing on anything that I was wanting is by advising on an amendment or offering an amendment. And they actually had some success, even on the House floor, with an amendment to the uh, marijuana bill. In the end, I voted against it because I'm not for recreational marijuana, but the bill needed some improvement, and the, uh, the uh, House Majority Leader actually advised that we accept that amendment. So we could get some things done, but it wasn't easy, because when you're in the minority, you have no choice of what bills are heard in committee or what bills are heard on the floor. And so um, I just make that point. Uh, just to talk about the uh, bill that he said I signed on to and then signed off, that was actually the heartbeat bill. And uh, there were reasons for me signing on to it and there were reasons for me to sign off of it. But that brings back the point, I'm an independent thinker. I don't just go along with what my caucus says we should do. And one day, I sat in my office trying to read through a bill that was coming to the floor and I'm trying to understand the consequences of what that bill would, would have for our state. I actually sunk back in my chair and I said to myself, if my name is on this bill, I'm responsible for every person in this state because they have to follow this law. It made me realize the profound responsibility that I have to our citizens and it made me very humble to know that I am your representative. 
and I hope to be your representative again. Thank you. Nick Franks. First of all, again, I want to thank the League of Women Voters. I've been a proud member of the St. Peter League of Women Voters for seven years. I want to thank my fellow candidates for their time and to the people out there who've taken the time to watch. Thank you very much. For my first campaign literature, our slogan was simple. Your voice at the Capitol. That's how I see my job. That's what I want to do. And I'm asking for your vote to send me back for a third term in the Minnesota State Senate. My legislative record includes things that I think are important to the district. Among the, among the things we've got passed, I was in the more minority for those six years representative, chief author of the Highway 14 bill. That's an important piece of legislation, over $70 million, that will make us safer and improve our transportation for personal and business reasons. The Farm Safety Act that Representative Brand mentioned, we felt the tragedy of the Nicollet County family that lost someone who we were very proud in a bipartisan manner to pass that money to make farms just a little bit safer. Bonding projects, almost too numerous to mention where I was proud to be the chief author, but among them, over $70 million for the state security hospital to provide greater safety for clients and staff. South Central College to upgrade that facility. Now over 1,700 residents of this district are students at either the Faribault or North Mankato campus. I'm very proud of that. The MSU Clinical Sciences Building providing incredible opportunities for dental and nursing students over there. A state-of-the-art facility for what I think is a, a jewel of the entire Penn State system. And then finally, for the work that we're doing to keep people in their quality of life in our district. It's been suggested that people are moving out of Minnesota. I'm afraid that fact just isn't correct. We had the census and what it said is the growth in Minnesota over the last decade was 7.8%, higher than the national average. This is an outstanding state with great opportunities. This is where people want to raise their families. And we recently saw that the state of Minnesota's unemployment rate was 1.8%, the lowest in the history of this country. A AAA bond rating. That's the state we live in now. I'm proud to be endorsed by police, by fire, by farmers, by teachers, by working men and women, by health care. And I'm proud to serve as assistant minority leader of the Senate. And with your vote, I'll return to St. Paul and be your voice again. Thank you very much for having me. Mark Rice. So someone early on in the game of campaigning taught me something, and I take it to heart. He said, I'm always willing to have an adult conversation with anybody on any subject. And I would suggest to you as a senator that I'd be willing to have a conversation with anybody on any subject. And I would make great effort to meet people on the other side of the aisle on conversations not related to politics or a bill of legislation, but get to know each other so that when they need something and they need my vote, I know who they are, I know what they stand for, and I can trust that, they may, that they're going to share with me information that's valuable and important to making a decision. I've been a businessman for 40 years. You serve three constituents. You serve your customers, you serve your employees, and you serve your vendors. Those don't always agree with each other in, on various issues, but you learn as a businessman to take everything into account before you make a decision. We have a county that has a very, very wide diversity. We have a very strong farming community, you look at the Census Bureau uh, statistics on our state, they classify us as a manufacturing county. So you have very diverse people to serve here. And as you've heard tonight, the opinions and perspectives on the issues are very diverse. And I think Susie has shared with me a number of times how difficult the position that is to be in when you have that much diversity and you also have a fairly strong opinion coming from both sides. You have farmers that want one thing, you have manufacturers that want another. But we do have issues in the state that need to be addressed. We have inflation that's, that's just raging right now and affecting Minnesotans' ability to live here. Two, we have public safety issues. Crime is on the rise and it's causing a major issue with our public safety people. And three, the quality of our education locally is really hurting and it needs to be addressed. And I believe. I can do that by listening to both sides of the argument. Thank you. Well, I want to thank all of you. If there was an audience, we would maybe give you some applause. But again, we are recording in front of an audience of no one tonight. Uh, except for our League of Women Voters volunteers, we have timekeepers, we have um, organizers who are here present tonight. Um, it has been my honor. I'm a member of the New Ulm League of Women Voters. You heard Mr. Nick Friends show that he's a member of St. Peter League. That's one of the things the League of Women Voters does to make sure that we are impartial 
I come over here to help the St. Peter when they have a candidate on the panel, and St. Peter comes to New Orleans when we have a member candidate on our panel, and we, I have had the honor and privilege to work with St. Peter League for several years. The League of Women Voters, in my uh, unbiased opinion, does a great job with these forums, and it is our goal to provide the community with an unbiased opportunity to hear what the candidates have said, have to say, and I think they all did a great job tonight. If you did not, if you have more questions for the candidates, please contact them. That is your right as a voter. These are your candidates for the jobs that they have chosen to apply for, and this is your opportunity to interview with them for that position. Thank you again to the candidates. We are, have had, co we have been co-hosted tonight by the St. Peter Chamber of Commerce and the St. Peter Herald. Uh, the St. Peter School District, of course, is hosting us tonight. Um, the City of St. Peter, and uh, again, thank you to the fellow League volunteers. To all of you watching, thank you again um, for your interest. If you have in, uh, need information about voting, registering to vote, candidates um, for office uh, uh, in your for your location, you can get all that information at one stop www.vote411.org. Thank you.